Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. It's Brandon Laws. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. The demands of HR and payroll are endless. And that's why Zenium provides a complete solution for both so you can focus on what you do best, which is growing your organization. Learn more about Zenium at zeniumhr.com. Okay, today's episode, I'm talking with Beverly Jones. She's the author of Find Your Happy at Work, 50 Ways to Get Unstuck, Move Past Boredom, and Discover Fulfillment. Boy, is this a conversation that we all need to hear right now. So a lot of us are working remotely, uh, including yours truly, and others are just stuck in this hybrid environment, and others never left the workplace. And I think we're all in a different place and we're all trying to find ways to to get out of our little rut. I know I've been through several ruts during the last, what, 20 months or so, and I'm always looking for interesting ways to get out of it and also support my people as well. So you're going to get a lot out of this conversation I had with Beverly Jones. Enjoy the episode. Make sure to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Connect with me there. I love connecting with listeners. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me there. And Of course, if you are willing to give a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, that's how people across the world are finding our show. I would very much appreciate that. And for the first 10 people within the next week, provides a review, who's listening, I'll send you a book. How about that? Book of your choice. Enjoy today's episode and I will talk to you next week. Beverly, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for coming on. I'm so happy to be here, Brandon. I think we're going to have fun in this conversation. Oh, I know we'll have fun. We're, we're here to talk about your book, Find Your Happy at Work, 50 Ways to Get Unstuck, Move Past Boredom, and Discover Fulfillment. We were just talking offline, and I think it's worth mentioning to the listeners too, like what was the genesis of this book? Why why did you start writing it? I know you started writing this at the beginning of the pandemic. Was it something you needed at the time? It's just something that you kind of put off for a while. Maybe share that with listeners. Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about the chapters of this book and deciding or trying to decide whether or not I wanted to write another one. But I was noticing that so many of my clients, many of them are are leaders and big organizations, including a lot of federal government folks. I noticed that they were trying so hard. They cared so much about their employees, but my leaders weren't happy. And they're employees, uh, their team members seem not to be happy. And so I was thinking for quite a while, how do I grapple with this as a coach? And the more I kind of grappled and wrote notes, the more it looked like it was going to be a book. So I did a proposal and it was accepted. And I sat down to write. And then about a week later, COVID started. So I wrote the book in the process of experiencing with for myself and with my clients all the things that everybody was going through. And it turned out to be a bit of a different book than I started with. But for me, it was like therapy. And I guess that that having this focus and reading about all the research that suggests how much control we have over our own happiness, it was not a bad way to get through COVID, I'll tell you. No, I love that. I love that you started with like, oh, I think leaders need this. And you pick up the book and you think, oh, maybe this is for individuals. But I, I really think like if leaders pick up this book and they figure out a way to be happy, th- this is going to trickle down to the whole workplace. I mean, leaders really set the tone for a, a workplace culture. And if they could be happier in, in the way they treat their employees, I think that might rub off on them just a little bit, don't you think? Yes. When I started to write it, I actually was going to aim it at leaders. And the more I played with it, the more I thought, no, it starts with the leader as a person. If 
the leader works on these issues and, and works on mindset and gets a feel on how sometimes work feels like play and all of those things, then the leader has a starting point. And you can't impose happiness on people if you don't get it yourself. So the people in my head that I was talking to sometimes as I were writing were often leaders, but really I was talking to kind of the young versions right. of those leaders. Let's go back and look at how you... Uh, became a leader and what you care about and how it fits in your life. And let's grapple with that. And then all of this employee engagement activity may take care of itself a little bit. Yeah, there was, I, I cannot remember the chapter it was in, but just anecdotally, I remember you talking about an employee, I think it was in the hospitality industry, but just disengaged and pretty negative, I think. And then I think he was serving mm -hmm. the leader of the organization and just the way that leader treated this person with respect. And even though it was a lower level employee, just, I think that changed the perspective of that person. And then, and they decided to change the way they behaved amongst other people. I love that story. That was exactly right. This fellow had had some hard times and was working as actually a dishwasher. So he, this was the first opportunity for him to, to be a waiter. And he had this voice in his head telling him, you're nobody, you're never going to be anybody. All these fancy people in this hotel restaurant, they're all somebody and you're a nobody. So then the leader of the organization who was respectful of him and introduced him to the other guests. And the guy thought, oh my gosh, I feel like somebody. He treated me like somebody. And sort of in that moment, he went from being missionless to suddenly knowing his path in life. And within about eight years from that time, when he was a 19-year-old dishwasher server, he was manager of a resort. And he just kept telling, it doesn't matter if you're talking about your employees, your team members, your colleagues, your boss, or your customers. If you treat everybody like they're really somebody special, then everything else can be worked out. And that was his, the mission that guided his extraordinarily successful career. I love that. What's the engagement triangle? And how can we use this to be happier at work? The engagement triangle, I just kind of imagine a, a triangle with three points, and the points represent issues, factors that everybody in the business of human resources knows are very important, and all the leadership books talk about it. One, of course, is purpose. Another is all the people involved, in the, and the third I call performance. And can I go through those three a bit? And Of course, I'd love to. Well, when I use the triangle, and my clients always seem to call it do the triangle, although I never <laughs> thought of it that way. But they say, let's do the triangle. But what I do is I give them a little uh, writing about the triangle in a picture and explain that if we ask some questions about these things regularly, that's an easy way for you to get a hold of the things that are going well and the things that aren't going so well. So with purpose, that can be the mission of the organization. It can be the mission that the person has in working at the organization. You know, why are they there? It can be the alignment between the two, or it could be, you know, sometimes people are just taking a job to make money. Is it because they want to feed their kids? They're saving for grad school? So having a constant sense of serving a purpose, knowing what your service is and connecting with it, that can make you happy. You can have a purpose and kind of forget about it. And then you start to float but as soon as you feel like you're supporting your purpose, you're supporting the mission, you start to feel better. And then people, of course, is, is just so essential. We are social beings. There's a lot in the book about how we've evolved to be emotional and empathetic and work together, and those skills are very helpful to us. But if we're disconnected from people, it's hard to be happy in work or anywhere else. I think one thing that I notice with clients sometimes, they talk about being burnt out or not respected or all kinds of problems. But sometimes, not always, but sometimes a big part of the problem is that they are lonely. They're detached from other people. They're not connecting. And certainly that's been huge during COVID. People who normally had circles they saw regularly or communities they hung out with haven't built the skills yet or dealing remotely. So people in the work context can be, who are the stakeholders? Who are you doing this for? Who benefits from what your activities are? Who are the people you could meet who'd be interesting because you have this position? And then finally, performance. That's how you do the work, how you do the task. 
but it's also how you manage yourself to enjoy doing it. You can make a game of something boring. You can speed up something tedious by making better processes. You can find more enjoyment in just about anything if you find ways to learn, to use your expertise, to go a little deeper. Uh, So your approach to doing the work and how you do it for an individual is more within your reach than you think. You know, part of it is just the attitude you bring, but part of it is, you know, the steps you take. And if you keep in touch with what is it you're bringing to the job? What are you bringing to each task? Are you doing it in a way where you can have some fun or are you doing it reluctantly because you don't really feel like you like the boss today? You know, all of those things fall under performance. You're a big proponent of journaling. How is journaling helpful to us for being happier and more productive. And, and I don't know if you personally journal regularly, but uh, I'd be curious any tips that you have for how to structure journaling. Like, what do you put in it? Do you handwrite? Do you do it electronically? Anything like that? I, I've fallen off a journal. I used to journal a lot and it's just, I, I don't get in a regular habit of doing it. And I, I do notice that I am better off when I do journal. It's just a matter of like, how do you structure it in your day <laughs> to do it? And I, I would love any tips. Yeah, I don't think there's one way to do it. And I am like you. I'll do it for a while. It'll make a huge difference. And I, my journal becomes my friend and I really enjoy it. And then, you know, life gets busy and or maybe I need something else. So I change my style all the time. And the reasons you're journaling might help you decide your style. One thing, of course, is for people who had a trauma or maybe a, an illness or something really difficult, there's a special value in writing about how you feel. What does the pain feel like? What was it like? What happened? Somehow, if you write about something, you can kind of organize it in your mind and put it in a distance. And there's all kinds of research suggesting that people who write about their pain after surgery actually heal faster. So there's that kind of emotional writing. But in the context of work, I do it more to kind of keep in touch with why am I doing this? What's my intention. I don't write about the triangle as such, but I write about the things in the triangle. And I do a lot of kind of aspirational lists as well. I keep lists of people I want to get to know better or, you know, things I would like to do or great ideas for such and such a project. I kind of like having them written down. It feels like money in the bank to have those lists. So that makes me feel good. And then finally, keeping track of anything makes you better at it. Right. And so for some things we could use Excel spreadsheets, which I personally find tedious. I'd rather like do it in a a book, (laughs) but anything that does better when you track it, which is just about anything, does well if you do kind of a quick status report at the end of the day or sometime. And on the question you asked of using a laptop or writing handwriting, there is some research about it. There's a view that when you use a a pen and pencil paper, two things happen. One is that your brain operates differently when there's the connection with the body, that movement. And so parts of your brain actually engage more deeply into what you're doing. And so for that reason, writing by hand is more effective. But also in terms of taking notes in class or in a meeting or when you're trying to work something out, kind of learning from your notes, it seems that when we type, particularly if we're fast, type as we do it all the time, We tend to type without really thinking about the concepts, but if you're writing about something by hand, you have to think about it, you have to sort it out because you can't write that many words that fast. So writing by hand seems to be more effective if you're trying to work out a problem or something like that. You talk about gratitude a lot in the book and and how it can make people happier. Would you use uh, the journaling as, as part of that? So like, you know, what am I grateful for? Things that happen throughout the day, just jotting those down so you can reflect on those. Is that how you'd structure it? Yeah. And I, I think this is where lists work well. I've seen this with clients who don't really want to journal, but if they say at the end of the day, write down three things, maybe on a card or a chart or something like that, that they feel grateful about whether it's, this is what went well today, or I'm so lucky I have this in my life, just three things, maybe a phrase, three phrases, that seems to be enough to stimulate 
a sense of gratitude. When you experience gratitude, you can't be anxious at the same time. It's like our brains can't process both of those states of being at the same time. So stimulating a sense of gratitude is a great way to kind of lower your blood pressure and slow down and and feel a little better than you felt the minute before. I think a lot of people struggle with, they know they need to make big changes in their life, but they don't know how to go about it. And you talk about breaking those big changes into tiny little steps and you call it the sugar grain process. I thought that was a great illustration. Can you describe that for listeners? I think that was really cool. Yes. Well, I had started when I was so maybe 14 or so and in my family, everybody drank tea all the time. My parents were Brits and it made sense to them. And so after school, I might have three cups of tea with milk and maybe three teaspoons of sugar. And I started realizing, oh, this is not healthy. I can't be having this much sugar, but I can't go through life without tea and I can't drink tea without sugar. And I thought, Hmm, I wonder if I just took off one grain, I wouldn't know the difference. And then if the next day I took off two grains and just gradually reduced it, maybe I could learn to enjoy tea without sugar. And so that's what I did. And it was like mind blowing to me as a teenager. I said, oh, you can do all kinds of things if you just do it a little bit at a time. So later in life, I was in a situation where I was sort of the campus activist as an undergrad and then a young grad student at Ohio University. And since I had been a journalism student, I was on the radio and I was giving speeches and I was writing stories and things like that and became the first woman in the MBA program. And I was very focused on one thing, and that is equal opportunity of women to perform well in universities and in jobs. Because in my early days, a lot of jobs were close to women or they were hard to get. So anyway, I got hired by the president of the university to run the program for implementing Title IX when that was finally passed, for making equality an essential part of the university. And I knew nothing. I was, I was just a grad student, at, you know, in my 20s and knew nothing about organizational change or leadership or any of those things. But I remembered the sugar grain. I thought, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know one thing, that if I do something every day, if I just do a sugar grain of activity in support of the proposition of the equality of women and all people, I can't go wrong. So I just started every day trying to come up with little sugar grains. And I worked with lots of other people, and we all just kept trying to do small things. And really, we created pretty extraordinary change in a short amount of time. It was a lesson that I've carried with me. And my clients sometimes make a gesture when I'm asking them to do something. They'll hold up like an imaginary cup of tea, and they'll drop a grain of sugar into it. (laughs) Because they're getting it that I'm saying, all right, it's a big thing, but you don't have to do it all. Just do a sugar grain and get started. Yeah, if people want to explore more on this topic, Atomic Habits is a great book on this concept. So pick that up for sure. Yeah, there are a lot of books about habit, a lot of great books out there, but habits are built a sugar grain at a time. And so anybody who's kind of struggling with Oh, how organized they are. I, I, I recommend that book and other books about habits so that you can notice your own and you can change them. I'd mentioned to you before we started recording that every chapter of your book has, I swear, one or two book recommendations. So I found myself like jotting down a bunch of books. And one in particular was the uh, biography of Benjamin Franklin by Walter Isaacson. I'm a huge fan of Walter Isaacson's books. I've read several of them. And I need to pick up Benjamin Franklin's Because you said he's the self-help guru and he's great at self-improvement. So what can we learn from Benjamin Franklin about learning, self-improvement and all that? Well, Benjamin Franklin started early to create his own career. I think he had only three formal years of schooling and he was put in as an apprenticeship with his older brother and as a printer and that didn't go well. So by the time, I think he, as I recall, about 12 years old, he went off on his own to Philadelphia to kind of create his career and start out being a printer. And he decided that he would learn to write, learn to speak better by reading books. He decided all kinds of things. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But he created a notebook, being a printer, I guess he could, that listed what he thought were virtues and then gave him little check marks, an opportunity for check marks um, for each one every day. And he kind of built a sugar grain process himself and he tracked it very carefully. 
it ultimately, he gave it up just like all us journaling people do. He, it was too cumbersome after about a year, and he decided that it was just too difficult a thing to keep up. But he kept up the process without the notebook after that. And for his whole life, he was always reinventing himself and trying to get better. And the thing was, he was quite a flawed man. He wrote that chastity was one he had great difficulty with, and there were others. But he never gave up, just little steps at a time. He went from being a person without education and a lot of confusion about life to somebody with a lot of values. And he changed his mind about things like slavery and and women, their role. And he, he became more enlightened as time went by because he kept learning and he kept trying and he forgave himself when he had, had made poor judgments and, and recreated himself. He wasn't perfect, but that's part of the charm. He kept trying. Yeah, I love that. Something I know a lot of people can relate to is just having a lack of motivation. You know, a lot of people have, their life got flipped upside down with this pandemic and whether it's working from home or being around kids or just childcare and, and schooling and all that and, and trying to work at the same time, you know, the, the motivation to actually work and get moving and being productive is challenging. I know myself, I struggle with procrastination every once in a while. And, you know, I'm curious if you have tips for people to just get started, get motivated, have, have the courage to just get started, almost like the sugar grain process, but for productivity. What do you think about that? It is the sugar grain process. The trick about motivation is we tend to think that if we were uh, more motivated, we would do things. And we talk about other people that way. This person's talented, but they're just not motivated. As though success and action always follow motivation, but actually it often works the other way around. That if you take a step, even if you do it kind of half-hearted, a small sugar grain of a step, that can lead to motivation. If you can just bring yourself and I'm talking to myself here, um, writing a book is an example. If, if you can just say, all right, I don't feel like writing today, but I'm going to write 500 words, or I can write 50 words, you know, whatever seems manageable. If you just do a sugar grain of activity, then all of a sudden you'll feel better. You'll have a sense of accomplishment. You'll feel a tiny bit more both confident and happy, like you can celebrate a little victory. You're going to be, you know, in a better frame and you're going to have an ability to, to be more creative when you feel a little bit better. So the simple answer is that if you're not feeling motivated, do something. And it almost doesn't matter what. It may not be directly related to the thing that you're, you're struggling with. It can be first get yourself moving and make a commitment within a time certain to make a step on the thing, you know, do a sugar grain yeah. and do one the next day too. Yeah. It's almost like that concept of eat that frog. It's like get rid of the biggest task in the morning or just do something to just, it might snowball your productivity really just instead of checking email for an hour of little tasks and just busyness do something that's productive and I think you feel a lot better and you'll want to do another one and another one and another one. Yeah. And, and in other words, uh, the frog, I love the, that concept. You do the toughest thing first and get it out of the way, but sometimes it's hard to do anything. So some days maybe you don't have a frog you're grappling with. Some days it's just getting started. So then get a tiny frog, <laughs> do something little, just start moving and celebrate and congratulate yourself for that and then commit to do another little thing within a time certain. Something I've noticed a lot, and I don't know if it's a product of just the technology, social media, all these distractions that we have, the notifications from our phones and chats and whatever, but we're in a constant state of busyness. And I think it's making us less happy. Is there a way we could, I don't know if it's using our calendar as a planning tool or any way of structuring our day so that we're, we're not just reacting to the notifications, the text messages, the emails, things like that to just distract us from actually being productive. What do you think about that? I think for a lot of us, if we take a fresh look at our calendars, that can really help. We tend to drift into a sense that our schedule, our calendar is the enemy. 
particularly now that other people can put dates and assignments on our calendars. It's like the calendar feels like it's a list of commitment to do things that other people want you to do. And I think you can recapture the benefits of the calendar by changing it into something which is a a contract with yourself about the commitments that really matter. So the first thing to do is resist having other people take over your calendar. If, if you really don't have time to do any, take a break, to feel any happier, to do the things you really want to do, to accomplish the things you want, you want to take back some of the time, a totally packed calendar that isn't functional. You can look at it and you can see something's wrong. And then think about the things that are most important to you, not just on the job, but in your life. If being healthy is something you think about, and I hope one does, then make sure your calendar includes times for a little exercise, time to get up and move around. Relationships matter so much. If you don't have time ever on your calendar that you've totally committed to other people that you want to be with, then maybe that's something you should start incorporating. So not have the calendar just as a list of meetings, but think of it as a way to make conscious choices about how you're going to use your time and your attention and uh, pick out the times when you're strongest in the day, like, you know, a lot of people are smarter in the morning. Not me. (laughs) (laughs) Do your most challenging work. Well, it varies a lot, but it's really a matter of managing your intention and attention and building in things that are happy and support your well-being, as well as that endless list of meetings. I had heard somebody say this the other day, and I think it's a, a popular quote somewhere probably from an author, but it said something to the effect of the caterpillar thought its life was ending right before it became a butterfly. And I think about challenging times that people are going through and how that's such a, it's a weight that we carry with us in the workplace, at home, anything like that. And I'm wondering what you think about those challenging times and for people to sort of shift their mindset to think like, okay, this is the challenging time I'm going to get through, but it may be the start of something really good. What do you think about that? That makes absolute sense. It's sometimes easier to suggest to another person than to do oneself. But as soon as you start focusing on the future, having hope that things will get better, thinking about things that can happen down the road, everything starts to feel better. Yeah. You said that lonely people face issues like diminished cognitive performance. They they have exhaustion, depression, and just really disengagement. They're less productive in general because they're not as connected. How do we inject more connection in the workday? And I mean, this is, I'm speaking to leaders here too. You have workplaces that are hybrid or remote. For the most part, connection is harder than ever right now. What do you think about getting more connection throughout the day so people aren't feeling lonely. It is a huge challenge. And probably like you, I've been reading everything I can get my hands on and who's doing well with remote work, including organizations that were grappling with it a while ago before the pandemic. Part of it seems to be to having those casual conversations that we used to have when we went for a cup of coffee, just having opportunities to casually connect with people, that seems to be tremendously important. Part of it is having meetings that aren't always stiff, you know, having times where maybe you're going to do some big thinking or talk about what you learned here so they feel more like real conversations in which you can connect. And another thing is that as Particularly, we we feel like we can get out of the house more and the pandemic is hopefully really starting to wane. If you're working remotely, that doesn't mean that you don't need people. And there are limits to how much we can feel connected when we're only doing remote work. So sometimes maybe people just need people and you find a shared workspace or you sit in the coffee house if your neighborhood allows that again and you go for a walk where other people are walking. Just being around people can be part of what you do as you structure your work day in a time when you're working remotely. Yeah. And and furthermore, on that topic, you talk about transparency and how in our relationships, it can create more trust and deeper connection. You know, but for somebody who's really closed off, maybe introverted or just not normally an open person, how do they take the steps to be a little bit more vulnerable and transparent so that way we can, you know, create those, those trust building blocks. 
I, I think the answer is, is kind of the, the same answer as how do people start to network a little bit mm. when they really hate networking, but they know it's good for them. And I think what you do is you start where you are. You think about what the challenges are. It sounds like you're talking about somebody who, who knows it would be good to connect a little bit more and find the things that they are comfortable with relatively, uh, speaking up about X at a meeting or you know sitting in the back of the room at a meeting, whatever it is, and then take little steps from there. It might mean logging on early. Sometimes it, people are chatting before the meeting begins. Do that. It might mean if you don't like to talk in meetings, coming up with a topic and finding a way to talk that well, you'll be comfortable. But you're talking about engaging with other people, whether it's in the context of just not being so isolated or wanting to do it because you want to grow, or whatever it is, get a good handle on where your comfort zone is and then just go out of it a little bit and do a little bit more tomorrow. It's another sugar grain process. Beverly, I've so enjoyed the conversation. I really enjoyed your book too. If you know, for anybody who who wants to pick it up, it's it's something you can read and skip around. And there's just there's a lot of t- every chapter is a, a new tip on how to get happy at work. So I really enjoyed it. Where can people learn more about you? Find your book, anything like that that you want to share with people? Well, my website is Clearways consulting.com. That's clear ways with an S at the end of way, clearwaysconsulting.com. The book, I'll read you the whole title. Actually, I have to keep reading it because I get it confused (laughs) with my other book title, which is similar. But the subtitle is Find Your Happy at Work. And the subtitle is 50 Ways to Get Unstuck, Move Past Boredom, and Discover Fulfillment. And it's available all the places people get books. If you have a favorite local independent bookstore, I'm sure they can order it. And all of the big booksellers have it now. I love it. Beverly, thanks for coming on the Transform Your Workplace podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved talking with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's been wonderful talking with you.